call the clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to create duties to consider climate change impacts and to deal with consequential and transitional matters arising from the enactment of the Climate Change National Framework for Adaptation and Mitigation Act 2021 and for related purposes. I call the member for Ringa. I move that this bill be now read a second time. This bill will make consequential and transitional amendments to existing acts for the purposes of the substantive bill, the Climate Change Bill. This bill also introduces climate risk disclosure for Commonwealth entities. Commonwealth entities, like government agencies and departments, are exposed to the risks of climate change impacts. The Reserve Bank of Australia has observed that climate change is exposing financial institutions and the financial system more broadly to risks that will rise over time if not addressed. Since 2017, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure TCFD, led by Michael Bloomberg, has been leading the voluntary climate reporting standardisation for private companies. Companies around the world have recognised the value of climate disclosure. Benefits include more effective risk assessment, capital allocation and strategic planning. Banks, insurers, developers, miners and big business around the world have been rapidly incorporating climate disclosure in their annual reporting. After a landmark opinion by Noel Hutley SC and Sebastian Hartford Davis and legal cases like McVeigh versus Rest Super and the Australian Securities Investment Commission's and the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority's guidance on climate risk, Australian companies must start disclosing material climate risks or be exposed to legal and regulatory actions. According to APRA, a listed entity should disclose whether it has any material exposure to environmental or social risks, and if it does, how it manages or intends to manage those risks. 58% of ASX 100 companies now report using TCFD, up from 16% in 2017. More work needs to be done, but progress is being made very rapidly in the private sector. But unfortunately, the public sector is lagging far behind. How can we ask companies to report on climate risk, but not Commonwealth entities? A legal action last year claiming that the government is not disclosing climate risks on Treasury bonds demonstrates this. National governments have been successfully prosecuted in Ireland and the Netherlands for failing to adequately respond to climate-related risks. Moreover, countries are dumping Australian Treasury bonds over perceived lack of action and transparency. This is a looming credit risk. The Treasurer himself stood up in front of the Australian Industry Group and detailed the consequences of our inaction. These are higher lending costs, a burden on Australian households and investment skipping Australia as a destination. Other governments are now leading the charge. On May 20 of this year, the United States President Biden signed an executive order on climate-related financial risk. President Biden mandated that the US federal government would advance consistent, clear, intelligible, comparable and accurate disclosure of climate-related financial risk including both physical and transition risks. The Australian federal government is exposed and should do the same. This bill will ensure that the accountable authority of a Commonwealth entity must consider in the exercising of duties or powers the potential risk of climate change and the potential contribution to Australia's emissions of greenhouse gases and broader impacts for, from these actions. This bill will, will also establish the reporting on material risk to those entities and disclosure of actions taken to mitigate those risks. Stakeholders, including the community, will have confidence that the government is managing its own climate risk. The Minister for Climate Change can publish guidelines for accountable authorities to follow in their response to climate risk. These guidelines will be made by legislative instrument to ensure accountability. The bill enables the creation of the Climate Change Commission and the repeal of the Climate Change Authority. We know that the Climate Change Commission is needed to provide expert, fact-based, independent advice to policy makers. Only then can we really make sure that climate policy is made in the national interest for the benefit of all Australians. 
instead of what we are currently seeing, which is policy on the run being dictated by a minority of nationals with their hands out and they are looking at negotiating something that is not in the best interest of Australia. What we will get will be a confused mess of policies that does not efficiently and cost-effectively address climate impacts, adaptation, mitigation and our transition across all sectors of society. We've heard it all about a deal around things like inland rail that does nothing to stop climate change, but will further facilitate transportation of thermal coal. We've heard of carve-outs from agriculture, which stands to be the most effective not, well, actually the most affected area by climate change, but yet stands to gain the most. We cannot have political uh, deals dictating our long-term safety and our long-term prosperity. We need independent advice to ensure accountability. We know the UK Climate Change Committee, on which this commission is based on, has been effective at breaking political deadlock, the very deadlock the government is in at the moment in, with its lack of climate policy. It cuts through debate with sound and practical advice and putting forward exemplar policy that is usually accepted by government of the day and opposition. We must emulate that in Australia. Introducing the Climate Change Commission is something desperately needed in Australian pol politics. I'll introduce duties and reporting requirements on accountable authorities and Commonwealth entities. We need to pass both the climate change bills and this bill. It is very clear that the, work, the government has not done the work. The work is done, the community is behind this, industry, business, all are behind it. It's time to put a winning plan to Australia and to the world. I cede the rest of my time to the member for Indi. Order. Is the motion seconded? I call the member for Indi. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to second this bill and I do so, secure in the knowledge that I'm standing up for the economic future of regional Australia. Over the last few weeks and months, members of the National Party have made all sorts of outrageous, fear-mongering claims about the future of our regions. They've called for $250 billion of public money to pay big fossil fuel companies to continue to pollute. Mr Deputy Speaker, that's $30,000 for every single regional Australian that we could be putting towards hospital beds, more doctors in the bush, NBN, the elimination of black spot mobile phone problems. But the Nationals' big vision for regional Australia is subsidised coal mining. They've said that there are no jobs in renewables, but there are thousands of good jobs in renewable energy right now order. across Australia. Order. The Assistant Minister on a point of order. Um, just relevance. We're not here to talk about the Nationals. We're here to talk about this bill. Order. Can I encourage the member for Indi to focus on the matters I, related I to the bill? I absolutely will be delighted to, Mr Deputy Speaker. There are thousands of good jobs in re renewable energy right now across Australia, and we could grow hundreds of thousands more in export-oriented manufacturing if we were smart enough to capture the endless, low-cost renewable energy that shines down upon our continent every single day. We are on the precipice of another gold rush, and instead the government is looking to keep us in the Bronze Age, setting the goal of net zero emissions by 2050 and putting in smart place policies that cut emissions quickly, this is the single best thing we could do to drive the economy in the regions. To meet our domestic electricity needs whilst also growing new clean export industries, Australia will need to quadruple our supply of electricity and switch it all to renewable sources. And that will mean hundreds of billions of dollars invested into regional Australia. We know the world is moving to things like green hydrogen, green steel and green aluminium, and I believe that instead of importing them all from other countries, we should be exporting these products from regional Australia, exporting them to the world. The bill before us sets out a framework through which we can pursue this bright economic agenda. It sets out in law a commitment that the vast majority of Australians support that we will decarbonise our economy by the middle of the century, and it requires the government of the day to set out detailed plans to meet those legislated emissions reductions ta targets. And I've worked closely with the member for Warringah to make this bill robust and to make sure that this bill will deliver for the regions. I've inserted a regional economic safeguard mechanism that requires the new Climate Commission to make sure that regional Australia secures an equitable share of the economic benefits of near zero net emissions. And I've inserted a regions first clause that requires the Climate Commission to implement a strategy to maximise the economic benefits for rural and regional Australia and I've inserted a regions at the table rule that says the board of the new Climate Commission must have expertise in regional development. 
As a regional Australian who wants to see my region thrive long into the future, in my short time in this place, I've put in the work inside here and with my community to develop sensible, considered policies like this one. And while the member for Petrie would rather me not mention the National Party, I think in eight years, eight years, what have they actually done to tackle the climate problem in regional Australia? What have they done for the farmers? What have they done for the regional jobs in our towns? I'm proud to second Order. this bill, the Mr Honourable Deputy Speaker.